we have such a good turnout. Um, it will be recorded and it will be posted on our website on the calendar. You click on the calendar 22 and it should pop up, I guess. Right, Jen? Okay. Yes. So um, thank you for coming again for our just-in-time training. Normally, um, we have had in the past lovely get-togethers. We socialize and have pizza and see each other in person. So uh, I'm sorry it's Zoom, but um, it's really important that we have a little bit of um, chance. We have a lot of new volunteers, so it's a little bit of chance to go over what's going to happen. Um, so what I want to do is just give a little bit um, of a little history to the EDS drills. Um, we are having the senior um, flu clinic drive through at the senior center September 30th for seniors. We will have the um, extra high dose there available for seniors. But we're having the full EDS drill flu clinic at the Deerfield Highway Garage on Merrigan Way, just off Sugarloaf on October 4th, 10 to 1. We have lots of new volunteers, so I just, like I said, I wanna give a little background. Um, the state mandated EDS um, setups back in 2004, 2005, when we had the bird flu. Um, and we were lumped together, the four towns in South County um, in the Frontier District. And we actually had our first EDS drill was at the Frontier High School as mandated by the state. But um, man, I'm, you know, I'm a mother of four kids, grubby four little kids. You go to well baby visit and you get your kids infected and, and they're all sick. So that's all I could think about when we were at that EDS. It was horrifying. There was just people in line. Everybody was standing next to each other. So if you didn't have a cold or a flu, you probably picked it up at our EDS drill. And I was wicked upset with the state for making us do it. It just didn't seem like public health. So um, Liz Kugler, a uh, wonderful, wonderful volunteer with her cute little cars, we um, uh, came up with a drive-through plan. It was actually um, the only one in the state besides Barnesville County. We did it uh, the next year. At that point, we were getting free flu vaccines, so we had minimal paperwork. We just had to keep control of the, you know, who was getting what shots and batches and stuff like that. So um, our very first drive-through was at the industrial park. It was very large, and um, you know, it was one of those deals where uh, we couldn't see each other. It was a high capacity. We could put a lot of cars through there, maybe several thousand. So anyway, um, we decided that we really needed to have another uh, drive-through plan. So we came up with D2, which was at Yankee Candle corporate offices, a smaller version. Um, and we could see each other. It was still spread out and we could have four lanes of traffic, but, and it was very success, successful. It went through the 2009-2010 swine flu years. Um, then we decided that we needed smaller units, um, plans, and we did that through the elementary schools, uh, small clinics, because we were getting the swine flu uh, vaccine in small batches. So now, uh, because, and uh, John Pachoric was absolutely correct, in case that we get this um, COVID-19 vaccine um, early in the winter, when we still have cold weather, we need to have a, we need to practice. So, and we haven't practiced for a few years because we haven't had free vaccine for a few years. So this is wonderful that you're all coming because it's very important to our communities to be able to practice doing this again, since we have had a break of about five years. And um, also because we need to practice in case we do have it in the winter. If it comes in the spring and the summer, uh, depending on the number of doses we get, we will either do D2 or D1 at the industrial park. But that will be decided at that point, however it comes. D5, the Deerfield Highway Garage, is, is going to be two lanes, potentially three, you know, pull out for three on the um, back side of the garage if, um, versus the four that we had at Yankee Candle. 
um, there'll be adults and then children with adults. We have greeters, registration, triage, vaccination, and then a final review with the EMTs. Um, we've always been extremely lucky to have um, wonderful police officers um, from all four towns, um, but truly it's a lot easier to do traffic control rather than crowd control. And we've eliminated the parking issue through our drive through So um, hopefully everything will work out fine. Um, it's important to wear warm clothes. It could be chilly. Um, all the volunteers are going to park at Pilot Precision. They have allowed us to use their parking lots and then we'll walk over to the highway garage and have a check-in. All the volunteers need to sign in. We'll be socially distanced and have masks. Unfortunately, there's no coffee or donuts, but still we'll have water and snack bars and, and at every station. It's just, it won't be as social, I'm really sorry. We have enough people to cover for breaks. The bathrooms are at the highway garage and we wear, gara we wear um, gloves and sanitize between um, handling everything and we will socially distance. Um, we'll have a hot wash afterwards where we sign out. Everyone, please, please, through the whole event, watch everything to make sure that there's, if you see anything that we can do better, please make sure that you give us the opportunity to do that by telling us so we can put it into the plan. Um, we've used the I, uh, incident command system because it works. And so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna turn it over to Zach right now, and he's gonna talk about what incident command means and the flow chart and just go over some of the little basics. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm just gonna quickly talk. Um, there we go. I'm just gonna quickly talk about our instant command system. Um, very briefly, I just want everybody to, um, the, the background of the incident command system actually came out of the California wildfires a uh, number of years ago and they realized that many people didn't have the same language. They didn't have the same understanding about kind of the hierarchy. Um, organizational charts, stuff like that. So this, the incident command system was developed and in public safety, we've been exercising it over uh, many years now. Um, you might think of it as an organizational chart from your business or any of your organizations or a chain of command if you're familiar with the military or public safety. But really all it is, is it's a way of identifying what responsibilities are given to what individuals. So I know Carolyn's been working pretty hard to kind of figure out that a little bit ahead of time. Um, so we'll, we have language that we use in the incident command system, like incident commander or operations chief or things like that. The important thing for all of our volunteers to know is that through this organizational chart, you will have somebody who is both responsible for you and you are responsible. So it's just like a, a supervisor and Th that is the only person who really, you know, should be giving you directions, or if you have a question, you should be going to them first. Um, we will provide the incident command structure that day. You'll be able to see exactly who's in what role, um, but really for the volunteers, the only thing you have to worry about is who that person is above you and whatever your responsibility is. So um, at a very small level, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be that scary. And the idea with the incident command system as well is that it's a kind of, it's a breathing living thing. So if we're in the middle of the day and we realize that there is some job that turned out to be bigger than we thought it was gonna be, then in the moment we can say, hey John, I need you to take over food or something like that. And then we can pencil him in. And, and, that, and because that is shared and in that system, then we all kind of understand and, and know that you know, what our role is in the, in the overall thing. Um, and I think, you know, kind of the last thing is uh, because of accountability, we have a lot of volunteers and a lot of moving pieces. Uh, it's important that if somebody comes to you who isn't your supervisor, who you haven't met yet and asked you to do something, you should find your supervisor and say, hey, somebody came to me and asked me to do this. Does that sound right to you? Um, and also, if you're gonna go on break, if you're gonna leave for the day, um, if you have any sort of concern, question, something happens, that you just go to that one person um, above you. Um, and 
I think I think that's probably it for ICS unless there's any did I miss anything Carolyn or John or anybody else do you want me to share the chart yes I think that would be a good idea um I don't know if John Pachurk has anything he's he's another very experienced incident commander no I think Zach covered pretty much every part of it if people have questions certainly ask and we'll uh, we'll take it as we go Okay, Jen, if you could put that up, that would be great. Well, I say that, and now where is it? <laughs> oh, you're jobless. No, this yeah. is this is a job. Yeah, I can show you that, but it's I made an. Yeah. There's well, the that's okay. I can tell, I can, don't worry about it. I can say pretty much just um, tell you who's on there. Um, for the incident command, we have a unified command. That means we have a representative of every town. So it's, it's myself from Deerfield, Mike Archibald from Waitley, Caitlin Rock from um, Sunderland, and Vernique uh, Blanchard from Con Conway. Then we have we have a lovely turnout of a lot of boards of health. Um, so we're gonna have deputy ICSs because I foresee that this is going to be a multiple day event in a re once we get the COVID vaccine. So um, we want as many people ready to take on unified command as possible. So we have David Wolfram, um, Trevor McDaniel, Carl Nelke, Tina Hunting, Marie Eichen, and Devin Whitney Deal for sure. I don't know if anyone else, uh, like uh, Becky Jones or um, Fran Fortino or anybody else was coming, but that's at least who we have. So what mm -hmm. I was going to do was have um, the, normally the incident command is somewhere separate and they take in reports on regular, like an hourly basis. But what we're going to do, um, because we have so many new volunteers and new boards of health members, is we're going to um, the ICS command and the deputy ICS members are all going to be greeters. So we're going to be at the, when we go through the flow, we can show where everyone will be standing. Under the incident command um, is the public information officer. And um, normally that's Casey Warren, but we'll find, we'll figure out who's going to be there that day and put someone there. Uh, our medical officer is Bear Benson. Uh, a local doctor who's been our uh, medical um, officer for several years, at least 10 years or so. Um, our safety officer is Zach Smith. Our security officer is John Pachorek and the highway department is um, Kevin Scarborough. Underneath and reporting directly to the incident command is the operations chief. And that's Tolly Stark. Is Tolly, oh, there it is. Um, Tolly, uh are you on yes i'm here okay um could you just introduce yourself and wave to people and and tolly we've it's been wonderful tolly's done a couple tabletops she's brand new um, but she has done in the last couple of years a couple of the tabletop drills with us so she um has some experience and um liz kugler who was our operations officer for years and years and years right from the beginning um has moved to Hatfield and moved back home to Hatfield and she's now on the board of health in Hatfield but she has volunteered to come and um work with Tolly that day so we have um Tolly is the operations chief and but Liz will be there to help um everyone uh that has any questions Lisa White Lisa can you just wave your um so that Jen can put you up. Lisa is our medical advisor. And um, most people are, are familiar with Lisa White. She's, she's our public health nurse as well. Um, our non-medical supervisor is Camelia Whale. And um, she's an MRC um, volunteer. So hopefully we can sort that. Um, people can meet her that um, that day. I don't, is Camelia on? I don't, I don't think she's on. Okay. Um, anyway, then underneath that is, is everybody have, is, that have jobs and they report and we'll have um, that 
who you report to at your station um, that day. Okay. Um, we don't, we, we haven't, we, we decided, we've already worked out our plan more or less. So we don't have a planning chief and we don't have a logistics chief, which Lisa has been in the past because we have our vaccine, hopefully, and um, all our needles and stuff like that. So um, it's, it's fairly simple. But the idea is that you know who you report to um, that day when you're at your station. And, um, and if there's any issues, it goes up the chain. It does work. Okay. Um, so Tolly, do you wanna, or Liz, do you wanna say anything about the operations? This is, you know, a pretty big deal. There's Liz right there. So wave. <laughs> okay. Um, the next thing we were gonna do was the traffic uh, drive through the flow. Um, Jen, Jen Bartek, I saw her up. She was there somewhere. Um, Hi folks, I'm on my iPhone because my computer wouldn't support Zoom. So excuse me if this is rough speaking. Um, but if Jen wants to pull up the first, the uh, senior center video, or sorry, senior center map so I can go over the flow and what, where the stations are gonna be. And let me know when it comes up because I can't see it. Oh, it's not up it, yet. There, perf uh, that's this. That's the highway garage. Let's do the senior center one first because that's coming up. That's on September 30th. doing it on my laptop at home and so it's <laughs> a mouse pad and it's not like work sorry there fabulous thank you all right so obviously the the long street is north main street anywhere you see a blue dot is where a police officer will be to assist with traffic um, so we're going to be turning off north main street in between the church and the senior center and you can follow the uh, arrows and flows to the numbered station. Station number one for the Senior Senate Clinic is gonna be basically triage and registration. Um, we did a really good job of getting a lot of packets out to seniors beforehand to kind of have them pre-register. Uh, Lisa and I are gonna go through and organize all of those. Uh, they can still come in if they haven't registered, they can still come in and fill out the forms, but we're hoping that the majority of people have pre-registered for this. So we are just going to have them come up to station one we will get their forms ready they'll have their covid screening paperwork there and then they're going to move on to station two which is where we're going to have four inoculators um, we want three on the driver's side and one inoculator on the passenger side in case two people come in a vehicle that way we don't have to have people crossing in and out of traffic if they're inoculating we want to keep uh, pretty good solid lanes um, the thing with this one as well is it's happening on Wednesday, which is farm stand day. And we did that on purpose because a lot of senior citizens show up that day to get their meals as well as their vegetables. So there's going to be two lanes coming in one lane because the senior center really there's some seniors who didn't want to get the shot. So they just want to come and get their food and leave. So if they're coming in to get their food, there'll be a food only line. They'll go around the building like they always do. They'll pick up their meals and then they can leave. If they're coming for meals and shots, they'll be in the other lane and they'll go down to registration and triage and then over to number two where they'll get their inoculation and their meals. Um, they're going to exit out onto Conway Street and if they want to park to have be observed, uh, there'll be an EMS uh, ambulance there. If they want to be observed for uh, the time period, we request that they be observed for 15 minutes or we suggest it. They don't have to stay if they don't want to. They can leave if they'd like. Um, we'll have them park over, you can see where the cars are in the grass, or we can have them go over towards the PE side grass and we can have them park there and just be observed to make sure they're okay. 
then they can exit onto Conway Street. So it's a very simple <coughs> one-way traffic flowing. Everywhere that there's a, a blue dot, there'll be a police officer assisting with traffic so that we won't have anybody turned up or coming in the wrong way. So that we don't have to worry about any, as we call them broken arrows coming in. Uh, John or Chief or Adam, do you want to add anything to the Senior Center one? Yeah. Uh, Jen, good evening, everybody. I would just say that, you know, there might be probably two officers at each blue dot. Those are the spots. And then we'll have people available in case it backs up on North Main Street. So, um, you know, from the, I've heard back from Chief Savine and I'm sure, you know, our guys are lined up. We're going to have plenty of help. So no one should worry about the traffic flow and we'll have enough hands that if they need help in some other areas for this one, we'll make sure it goes smoothly. <laughs> Jen, Carolyn, just to jump in quick, if you are working the Senior Center event, please make sure you are paying attention at all times. Okay, we don't want somebody hit by a vehicle. And we do have some people out there driving right into their 90s. You will see people there in their mid 90s and some even above that, that will shock you. So just be careful, watch your feet and toes. <laughs> God. All right, and if we want to move so over to wear the steel-toed shoes that we have and uh, like body armor, body armor or something. No, 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 no. We'll have lots attention. of signs. It's, it's a we'll lot have lots of signs, and 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 everybody's out there, you know, trying to be friendly. So hopefully, everyone will be creeping by. Yeah, no, they're all good drivers, but it's a lot of stimulus mm -hmm. for the human yeah. brain to basically. Uh, process at once while they're pulling in and there's people on their right there's people on their left they're not used to that yeah so i just want people to be cognizant if you're on the passenger side of the car watch especially okay thank you john that's a really where good would point. you like volunteers to park um i think at the town hall the town hall is not open so you can park at the town hall and then walk over does that make sense? Is there any other questions on that? It's, it, that should be fairly straightforward. Um, okay, Jen, can you put up the, Jennifer, can you put up the um, highway garage? Highway garage? Yep. Is that the other one that I had? <laughs> yes, that's the other one you had, the original one. Yes, thank you. Now, it's much smaller. The idea is if it's, February and freezing Arctic vortex, we can have some heat on. We won't be having heat on, on October 4th, but um, so it's a little bit tight, but the idea is to do this. And um, we're gonna modify this layout. I just wanna say there will be a modified layout when we do have the COVID vaccine so that we can have an observation area for people to wait. But this is just the flu clinic we were gonna practice that, but people just don't wanna hang around. And actually there's no need for the flu clinic. So um, that's why. So we'll, we're gonna go ahead. So Jen, go ahead. I'm sorry about that, Jen Bartek. No worries. So now we're gonna look at the October 4th traffic plan. Um, as you can see, it's going to be entering and exiting off of Merrigan Way. So it's gonna be Sugarloaf Street. There'll be an abundance amount of police officers assisting with traffic on Sugarloaf Street. And if we have to have people wait in the breakdown lane, if it gets too crowded, um, we will have a great amount of officers there to assist with all of that. So they're gonna turn off of Sugarloaf Street and they're gonna go onto Merrigan Way. As they're coming down, you can see they're gonna go in front of the building. And station number one is gonna be where our greeting, greeters are. And they're gonna ask if they have their paperwork and if they need their paperwork. And then they're gonna move around the building to number two. And that's going to be our triage center. And that's, we'll have the cars kind of line up there. Triage will come out again with COVID screening, making sure everything is all set. And then they're either gonna, the triage folks will send them into either bay two or bay four. Bay two is just going to be adults. Bay four will be for the people who have children. The Zoom meeting, cause I'll lose it if I go in. So they'll either go into two or four. And then when they exit, again, all the blue dots are police officers. 
going over towards number four is going to be again the whether EMS observation area is. If folks would like to wait for the 15 minute observation area, the officer will have the folks pull in there and go kind of towards the salt shed and wait for their 15 minute observation and very simply just exit out against Merrigan Way, going back towards Sugarloaf Street and then back onto Sugarloaf Street. So it's a very easy traffic flow. We will adapt and overcome if we find issues the day of it happening, but I really don't foresee with this plan anything, any issues arising. Chief or Adam, would you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, Jen, I think it looks good. I mean, just so people know, um, you know, they'll be going through there, but we, we have uh, plenty of people so we'll make sure that it flows and people shouldn't worry about uh, anything to do with traffic and we'll be there to help any way they need. If, if there's any backup, it will be backed up on Sugarloaf Street, um, but the police will cone it off and um, you know, make sure that everyone is safe as we back up. We, we open, you know, the clinic is 10 to one but we're asking all the volunteers to come at nine o'clock so that we to try really hard to open early. So any backup we have eliminated and we just um, have constant flow. I think there's gonna be a lot of interest. So I'm a little worried about a backup, but um, we all, we'll have plenty of police officers to deal with it and to make sure people are safe. Yeah, great job, Jen. <laughs> Carolyn, if I can jump in for one sec. Sure. Yeah, so Sugarloaf Street used to be a four-lane state highway until the late 60s, until the bypass was built. So we do have significant area where we can put cars, and we'll flow it as reasonable as we can, depending on how many inoculators we do have. So I think that, you know, Jen, Adam, and I are very comfortable, and uh, we will cone off a breakdown lane if we need to, and we'll cycle cars one way. We'll have them go to the center of town, do a U-turn, come around, and cycle them right on the south side of the road so they can take a right in. And that way we keep traffic flowing. Yep, we'll make sure that it's coned off on Sugarloaf Street so cars can't park there and uh, we shouldn't have a problem. Okay. Does anyone have any questions at all on this? I do. This I, I have two questions. This is Mary McClintock. One question is, I, I don't under, I couldn't hear, when you're talking about the observation period, is it one five, 15 minutes or five zero? 50 minutes. No, 15. 15 okay. is, the rec yeah. is the recommended. Okay, so there's that question. Second question is, I live up in Conway. I don't know where this place is that you're talking about where we're supposed to park um, as volunteers. Is so it when okay? you leave the center of South Deerfield headed towards Sugarloaf Mountain, yep. that's called Sugarloaf Street. Right. So if you go down Sugarloaf Street, Merrigan Way is immediately on your right. It's the old Oxford Pickle. Right, that, I know that. Yeah, yeah. So you're going to take a right onto Merrigan Way, and you're gonna go straight in all the way where you see those red arrows, but where you see that first arrow bear left and go around the highway garage and said you're gonna go straight. You see those blue dots down there, those little blue dots? Those are two police officers. There's an additional building down there that you're actually gonna pull in with significant parking, and you're gonna park right next door to the highway garage. Okay, and when, Marie, I can talk to me about this. There was a notion of first shifts and second shifts, and I was not going to show up at nine. I was going to come later at, I don't know, what time. And is that a reasonable thing? Or is this a, like, I really need to be there at nine? Because it doesn't seem like getting into park if I'm, you know, if there's a backup of people getting shots. Well, originally, Mary, and this is my fault, originally we were going to practice um, uh, you know, shifts of people to get maximum number of volunteers trained. Um, but um, we decided because because this is COVID um, situation, we, we really are worried about people, you know, we want to socially distance and we're, you know, have masks and stuff. And we don't want a lot of people, extra people hanging around. So we, we decided to not do the shifts um, and just try to get as many of the newer volunteers mixed in with our older volunteers. And um, even though the older volunteers have not had, or experienced volunteers, I should say, our experienced volunteers haven't had the experience at the highway garage, not really worried about it because um, I think we'll be rolling out the vaccine over a long period of time. So we'll have several locations and several 
different options. I mean, that's why we have so many different plans. So um, what we're gonna do is, um, you know, if you can come, whenever you come um, is fine, but if you can come, you know, four, nine o'clock, that would probably be the best because otherwise there probably will be traffic and you'd end up waiting in traffic. So Mayor, Mayor there is a backup. Any volunteers that can't make it for five and nine in the morning, there's a road right next to the Polish club called Coates Avenue. That will bring you in on the side of the highway garage, almost on a side entrance. We will not let anybody in other than volunteers that are running late through that area. Oh, excellent, excellent idea, John. I, I didn't even really think about that. That's absolutely true. This is one of the reasons why we, this drill is so important because um, for that reason, you can adjust. Um, so it's Coates Avenue, everyone, um, and that's by uh, the Polish Club. And for the Senior Center, the, did you know where the parking was for that at the town hall? Were you doing? No, Mary, Mary was just doing on the 4th. All right. so. Okay. I, I have a question. This is Chloe Jones. Sure. Um, so uh, the sheet that you sent out with the volunteers and where they're going to be, I volunteered, but I didn't see my name on there. <laughs> are, you okay. able to, are you able to pull up that sheet and kind of show me where I'm supposed to be on the 4th? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, Chloe, I yeah. think uh, what we tried to do, because um, you are a new volunteer, and I'm sorry, uh, that's probably my fault. Um, why don't you come um, for nine o'clock? Mm -hmm. And um, were you a non-medical or a medical volunteer? Non-medical. Not, okay, just come and we'll put you in um, with the registration, okay? Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thank you. And I'm just on the uh, fourth. Right, the fourth. Okay. I'll, put, I'll, put you, I'll pencil you in. Thanks. Thanks, neighbor. You're welcome. <laughs> Carla, this is Veronique. I did have a, a question. Um, for those of us who want to get our shots at the same time, how are we doing that? Um, well, Lisa will, we, Lisa will address that, but usually what we do is we just have you come early, you know, nine o'clock. Um, we, we do our volunteers right then and there. I could add to that. I'd suggest, um, as we are suggesting for residents, that you download the forms, which would be on the FRCOG website, forward slash flu hyphen clinic. And so have that filled in with your demographic information, insurance card information and signed. And then that way, through the course of the clinic, we can cycle you through. You don't really have to do all of the stations. You're, you're ready to go. Um, We'll, we'll make sure you get anybody that's interested in a shot. We'll make sure that they get it that day. Yep. And just monitor yourself for any reaction or any problems. If you have had any issues in the past, please let Lisa know. Yep. So we can watch you closely. Yep. The screening form is also on the website. Um, if you've had flu vaccine in the past, that's a good indicator of how it will go this time. Um, but we want everybody to be safe. Um, thank you, John. I, that link to the um, what Lisa just mentioned was on the invite that I sent out. It will also it is also on our website. If you click on today's date in the calendar where the Zoom information was, it's also there. So um, I can put all the documents that we're viewing um, tonight there as well, um, including the uh, taping of this screening. Um, can I can I check in? This is Mike from uh, Waitley. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, uh, Carolyn, as usual, you've assembled a great team and a, and a great plan. And I want to ask, though, how are you feeling about our um, support team? Do we have everybody that we need? Should we be uh, looking for more volunteers? How are, how are things from your perspective? I, 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 Mike, I think we have enough volunteers right now. Um, like I said, I didn't we were thinking initially of doing all these shifts and but I'm, I, we don't really, it's just going to add too much to begin with. And 
we'll, we'll just, we're hopefully, hopefully we have enough people to today, you know, for the fourth that we'll be able to um, mentor newer volunteers uh, because just like in the H1N1, as you remember, we had, I don't know, 12, 14 clinics, whatever. It was a rolling out over several months. And I, I'm, I'm just thinking that that's what's going to happen. And um, again, so we got, we're going to have, we have the, we're practicing in case we get a smaller batch and in the winter time here at the highway garage. Um, but then um, we do have this, the, a potential for uh, D6 at the Sunderland Safety Complex. We have a preliminary plan for that. Not, not in detail yet, but if we had to do something, um, you know, the same day or, you know, for whatever reason, the highway garage wasn't available or whatever, we have other options. And um, of course, as the weather gets warmer, we have our original D1 and D2. So um, the idea is just just to get us going again yeah. and yeah. to um, regenerate our, our wonderful experiences that we had and, and make sure everything um, that we observe on this um, highway garage is that we, there's any problems like any bottlenecks, any issues that we can address and adjust for, and we'll be ready to go and see what happens. Uh, I, I think that's the best we can do. Makes sense. Michelle, um, you had a Carolyn. Carolyn. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Oh, this is Becca. I'm one of the nurses. Hi, everybody. Um, this is in the future, obviously, for the COVID vaccine, but given that it's going to be a new one and we're expecting hopefully that there will be a lot more people that will come out for that. And we're going to have to do monitor more closely and possibly for longer after administered. Will we be um, obtaining more nurses to do that and medical personnel in which it wouldn't be a similar situation because I don't think we'll be just monitoring people for 15 minutes. I think it will be longer and then my understanding because I work for the state is that we will also need to do follow-up monitoring via phone call or something else. Yeah um, we're gonna have we don't really know all the uh, ramifications yet for this vet flu vaccine but my understanding is that we're gonna have we don't know what people's reactions are gonna be we don't, there's no history. So we're gonna have real observation periods. And that's why I just said this, we decided not to put it in. It was just too much because we can't ask people to stay. The majority of people don't. And, and over the years, many, many years of doing this, we've only had a couple of people that have actually had reactions. So um, we're, we're gonna check people. And if they want to wait, then that's fine. If they mm -hmm. don't, they don't and we're gonna to have to adjust the plan for the actual COVID vaccine. And then, you know, that's the point of having um, a really involved group is we put all our heads together and figure out what would be the best options for all of us, um, you know, in, in c coming up with a design plan that will protect our community. Um, I mean, we really don't know anything about these vaccines yet, so. I think one of our biggest problems in our last several go arounds was that it, we actually tried to keep people. <laughs> uh, I think we gave out apples <laughs> one year, we gave out a questionnaire another year, we tried to keep them, we tried to make it slow. But when the COVID vaccine comes out, um, I think we're going to have a lot of people actually wanting to be monitored. Right. So we're going to have to act, have an an area set aside it's not going to be a grass strip it's not going to be we're going to end the we're going to need more emts um yeah. you know we're definitely and so that's going to really enter our planning phase but for now i think we need to just get as many volunteers like carolyn said familiar with the process and yeah. i think that's what we're doing now and i think it it's great and um, we can fine tune the ending parts. We're going to need a lot more police officers. <laughs> We're going to need, you know, there's going to be different, it, it's going to be real as opposed to, you know, there's going to be tensions, there's going to be different things going on. So I think that it, it's going to be different, but if we can get enough people trained into the basics, 
then the other stuff can just slide in and out. Yeah, that's, so that's why we're is, uh, is that they're going to roll out the vaccine in a relatively slow manner. So we know that South County is going to get a distribution. And, you know, if we get 500 vials of vaccine, remember, we have to divide it in half because there's two doses 28 days apart. So with that, one of the things that Carolyn and I have batted back and forth is an actual registration site where you would get a date and time that you actually show up and we would stagger people. So we didn't have to deal with a massive traffic flow. We would literally give people 20 minutes where they had to be 10 minutes early. This is the time of your vaccine and then factor in the observation period as well. So, you know, we will work this up as COVID vaccines roll around right now, statistically 58% of the populace is going to participate. As of right now, we know there's 12,000 residents in South County. So dividing the numbers out, you know, we just, we don't know how much and how quick vaccine we're going to get. Once we start to determine that and all these surrounding factors, Jen, myself, Carolyn, Adam, we'll, we'll factor a whole plan in, we'll pacify the, uh, the whole group because we got 40 amazing people here, bat it back and forth, work out the kinks and we'll proceed forward. Yeah, it's just, it's just better to do the one thing at a time, which is try to get our muscle memory going for the volunteers that have participated in the past and then try to mentor as many people and get them that have experience and get a handle on what we're doing. So, um, and then we'll adjust. We're, we're very flexible. Um, I'm, I'm very sad that um, it's not as, as social um, a thing as it normally is. It's much, usually much more fun, but um, we're practicing and this is really, really needful for our community. So um, I really appreciate it. I know Michelle had her hand up. Michelle, did you have a question? I do, it's a quick question. Jennifer keeps mentioning our website. Is that the FERCOG or is that a different website for information? I'm sorry, it's a Deerfield website. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. It's, um, it should be on everybody's website, but um, it is for sure on Deerfields. Um, okay, so the next thing we're moving on is um, Lisa's just going to um, do an overview of all the stations and people's roles, just to give you an idea. We're emailing them out and, we're, and what we're gonna do, um, just in case people get shifted around, rather than um, have to have as much interaction, we're gonna have the actual job descriptions at the stations as well. But, um, so Lisa, do you wanna go ahead? Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna focus in on the four core stations. Um, they've been mentioned already. Um, forms, registration, triage, and vaccination. Um, outside of that core, I'll say uh, the ICS team is going to serve as the welcoming committee, greeters, um, working the line and making people understand what the context of the EDS is. Um, forms are those two forms that I mentioned. The screening form is both a COVID screen as well as an injectable screen and the insurance form. If people come with them, that's great. They can move right forward, but we needed people to serve by giving forms to people who come without. And so these volunteers will be working the line back as far as it's safe to see if people have brought their forms completed or if they need forms and they'll um, be handing those out. In registration, um, we'll have both runners, people who are greeting the cars, and people who are sitting at copiers. And um, the job here is twofold, to collect um, insurance cards, have those copied, and then return them with the appropriate vaccine information statement. It's a requirement that when you give vaccines, you give folks before they get the vaccine information. So we'll have two um, vaccine information statement types. One is for injectable and one is for flu mist. Flu mist is a vaccine that's a live vaccine. Um, it's available in our clinics only to children. Uh, we do have a few short doses for adults who have um, special needs, but um, 
the state provides us the flu mist doses, and so it is, um, re it's restricted to child use. So age two through 18. So that's that registration. They'll just be giving information about either injectable flu vaccine or the mist and copying cards. Triage is the place where um, medical professionals go over the screening forms with folks. Um, for injectable vaccine, again, it's not a live vaccine. It's attenuated and the questions are fairly straightforward. Um, just that you feel well today, you don't have an allergy to eggs if we are using an egg-based vaccine. Um, you haven't had a severe allergic reaction to vaccine in your past and you haven't had an episode of Guillain-Barre. Um, for the live missed vaccine, again, for kids age two through 18, there are more questions. Because it is a live vaccine, you can't have um, underlying health issues that would contradict its use. You shouldn't be pregnant. Um, and so those questions will be gone over the staff people, the medical staff people at triage with residents. And then um, there's vaccine administration. We've wanted to set this up so it's safe for the drive through and also so that the vaccinators don't have to have a lot of encumbered um, record keeping. So each vaccinator is going to be paired with a scribe. Both are medically trained people. The vaccinators have to be professional licensed to give vaccines. Um, so the role of the vaccinator will be straightforward, but it's complicated by the fact that we have different formulas for different populations. Child missed, child injectable, adult injectable, and um, at the senior clinic, we have also senior high dose. So potentially four different vaccines, potentially new lots coming up as we move through the clinic. Um, and then dealing with people, you know, people are asked to stay in their vehicles for the um, whole clinic. If a parent needs to secure a child, we can have a parent get out of the car and get back into the car to hold a child safely. Um, we can have a person turn from their seat so that a vaccinator can get to the appropriate arm. But so there's that to navigate for the vaccinator, um, as well as is normal in vaccination clinics. Sometimes people are fearful, children especially, and what to do. As Carolyn mentioned, we'll have different lanes there. So family lane, cars with kids, over in that third lane if needed. We can work more slowly with people there. Um, also, um, adults that may have uh, special needs, they could go into that third lane too. The scribe will be with the vaccinator every step of the way. The scribe's job is to fill in the vaccine record so that it is correct as to what's given and also to communicate with the vaccinator and with the resident, the patient who's receiving the vaccine, the vaccine that they're receiving um, and uh, that it's cited where the person wants it. Um, so that record will be completed by the scribe. The scribe also will be completing vaccine certificates for people who need that record. As part of the clinic, we put into the Massachusetts Immunization Registry every vaccine that's given, and we have an obligation to do that within seven days. So providers will be able to see that and people will be able to access that record. But some parents, we're thinking, will want to have a certificate that they leave the clinic with. So the scribe also will be filling out vaccine certificates for people who need them for their children in school to verify vaccination or if they have a workplace that needs um, verification. And that um, pretty much covers the, the stations. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, weight area is not going to be enforced here, but we do recommend that people hang back a bit if they are concerned about feeling unwell. Another point I should bring up is that vaccinators will be asked to um, inject the driver first, just to stretch out that time as much as we can from the time the driver is vaccinated to where they're leaving the um, clinic. And um, as EMTs will be there, uh, Zach devised a way that we will ask people for a thumbs up if they're feeling fine and can continue on or a thumbs down if they feel like they need some assist. 
and that's all that I have right now. I'm happy to take any questions or concerns. Does anyone have any questions of Lisa? There will be full written out um, information sheets at the stations. And so um, please don't worry. Mary. And so it sounds like, so I'm on forms. So it sounds like I'm going to be sort of the roving minstrel handing out forms to people in their cars as I go along. And so I should be prepared to be walking up and down and and if it's raining to have my rain jacket on or my umbrella or whatever, but that um, that it's that there's more, you know, that there's the hand that that's a moving kind of role as opposed to a sitting in one place kind of role and that that which is fine. I just want to it's yeah sounds amusing and I and I also have a yellow reflective vest and that's I don't know whether there would be whether you'll be supplying things like yes. reflective vests to people who are roaming the lines. You want to you want to try to everyone should try to wear some bright clothing if they have it. But um, we have um, a safety vests for everybody. Mm -hmm. Over the years, we've um, invested, and in, you know, every chance we had a little pot of money, we tried to spend it on supplies. And one of the things we have always gotten is our safety vests and signage, and there'll be plenty of signage. Um, and Mary, it is true that you'll probably be going back and forth, but I wouldn't worry too much that um, uh, there'll be plenty of people so you can take breaks and stuff like that. Um, My exercise for the day. Always prepared for the weather because the variables are huge. And so you're absolutely right about that. Um, whatever amount of time you plan on being there, um, you're, you're, you're right. Um, your comfort is important. Yeah, wear, wear comfortable shoes, you know, that kind of thing. There'll be plenty of people so people can take breaks. Um, we, we certainly have built in um, that and and people shouldn't feel I mean if they're tired that we'll have places they can sit down and you know and and we that's part of being flexible we've always been able to do this Liz um, uh, since you've had experience with this before would you just do you mind um, talking about that a little bit about shifting out people oh, I think Liz is trying to unmute herself <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, at every station, there's going to be someone who's in charge of you, like a supervisor. So you just have to approach your supervisor and she'll either take your spot or else she'll, um, you know, flag somebody else down. And it really works out well. Um, it, it's a little bit different I, this I, year because, you know, we're going to have masks on and, um, you know, we're not going to have as much social interaction. But I, I just want people to know that um, it's, it certainly is not going to be onerous. And it's really, it is fun. It's just not, it's going to be as much fun, that's all. But it is much more serious this time. So um, I think um, people will understand the importance of showing up. And I and guess, you know, uh, don't suffer in silence. If you have an issue, you know, let us know. Um, yeah. I'll let your supervisor know. And, you know, if you see something, say something, you know, if something's clogging up somewhere, you know, let the supervisor in charge of your group, let them know that something's happening because not everybody can see everything. We have good bathrooms in the highway garage. Well, that's so that, that was the most attractive thing about the highway garage. <laughs> so, and, and so I'm just, I'm, I'm into thinking about logistics. And so I'm thinking about, I'm walking up and down the way and I'm handing out forms. Am I also, I assume I'm also handing out pens or pencils too, because not assuming that people have pens um, and are there clipboards or we just hand them forms and hand them pens and say, and then have a bucket for pens at the end or, I, you know, I don't know. Let me, let me address that, Mary. Um, I want to put a little bit of, framework of what it will feel like to be a forms person. So we have a carrying case made up and in that carrying case you have a box of pens, uh, you have <laughs> you have manila folders that are card stock so that if people need something to write on you're giving them that as a sturdy base and you give the pen away and we don't ask for them back. We bought more than a thousand pens. Um, 
and the forms are in there too in this carry case. And there'll be a home base where you can go to hand sanitize your gloves or change your gloves if needed, if you have to handle forms, but a forms person can wear the same gloves for a lot of time because you're only touching clean forms and giving them out to people as needed. Um, I just also wanted to say something that I forgot to mention about our safety concerns in cars. We're trying to keep it so volunteers will always stay on one side of the vehicle and we're not crossing traffic. Um, that's one of the reasons why we have so many vaccinators so that they don't have to switch in front of the car. We're also asking people to put their car in park at all stations where they're asked to stop and in the vaccination bay to actually turn their engine off so um, that that safety is maintained. I've also noticed in the past um, when things, you know, <clears throat> things kind of have lulls or the cars back up and everybody slows down, the incident command staff, the four of us, and now there's going to be assistant, uh, <laughs> we can tend to walk around and we ask volunteers, if you have any questions, if you have any problems, are you low on your pens? Are you low on your forms? So we'll roam, you know, every once in a while to, to find out if anybody needs anything. So there's plenty of us now that there's even assistance. Yeah. <laughs> there's now there's even more. Okay. And so that there's we're gonna be there to take care of every everybody. So don't and if anyone's not feeling well or whatever, please speak up. Let me chime in there. Caitlin, you're absolutely right. And we've been doing this a long time. And I hope everybody, Mary, you're hearing the voice of experience. Um, but you know, your first person to go to is your immediate supervisor. And our, our mission as incident commanders is to make sure that we get everything out of the way to make all of this as smooth as possible for each and every single volunteer. Um, and so whatever is in the way, um, bring it to your supervisor. They will bring it to the incident command and, and, and we'll move from there. And please, please, the, uh, the biggest thing that will help is at the end of the um, drill, when we shut down, we're gonna have a quick hot wash, they call it. And that's all it is, is like, does anybody have any ideas on how, any observations you had, and then any ideas on how to straighten out anything that um, could be straightened out or done better? That's gonna be huge for next year when, when it comes to COVID um, vaccine. So th thank you, Carolyn, that's absolutely accurate. And we need your input um, on how we can do it better because you're the voice of experience after this next exercise. Okay, so we're gonna finish this up. Is, oh, go ahead, Debbie, sorry. Uh, this, sorry, this is Becca, the nurse again. Oh. I just have a, two quick questions because I'm in my car in the parking lot at work after work, so I can't see everything. Um, I believe you said I was going to do triage. So I, did I understand we're going to get an email with all this information of where we will be in stations and such? Yes, Rebecca, you'll get um, information about the triage role and um, the vaccinator role also as a medical uh, staff person. Okay. Well, actually triage, I'm sorry. We changed that. And, 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 and the questions. second question is, Sorry, if for some reason there's an emergency or one of us wakes up not feeling well the morning of, who is the contact person? Because obviously if we're not feeling well, we shouldn't be there. That's or if somebody has an emergency, knowing that as a team, we're all in this and counting on each other. But what, what would you like done in that instance? You can call me. It's fine. Um, I'm, I'm anticipating not... Um, a lot of issues, we, we have one or two people that sometimes, um, you know, something comes up, family emergency or whatever. Um, so don't feel bad. Um, my phone number um, is uh, gonna be listed somewhere, but it's 214-413-214-9098. And so you can just call and we'll make sure that um, it's noted in the list and we'll make adjustments, okay? And absolutely. Um, we want thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Um, so we were, um, oh, Debbie, I'm sorry. Debbie, you, I, you have a question. I do have a question and it might've already been covered, but under, um, on Sunday, October 4th, it says frontier drive through, but we looked at the highway garage. So was that changed from frontier? 
Oh, oh, Frontier originally was at Frontier. Um, the first one we did in like 2005, but we haven't done any. Um, okay. Uh, well, I'm just, Frontier. my name is, my name is under there and it says Frontier. So I just want to make sure I go to the right oh, place. We're, we're called the Frontier EDS, uh, Frontier Emergency Dispensing Site. And it, we have different plans. Okay. Our, it's not the high school. Right. Okay. No. Okay. It's just, so it's, it's just, where we, it's that diagram we looked at. Right. It's at the highway right. garage. It's just that we're called the Frontier Emergency Dispensing Site. They, they, they named us that because of the, um, you know, high school was originally signed. But like I said, I was so horrified when we first did it. And um, Liz remembers, I was like, and Lisa, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I'm just feeling creepy uh, germs everywhere. And it was like, if you weren't sick before you came, you probably left being sick. It was terrible. So okay. Um, okay. that's why we started doing the drive through So it just was a public health reasoning and yeah. the state yeah. was fine with, as long as we did it, they didn't care. Okay, thank you. Um, it, so the last thing that we're gonna just go over quickly is um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page as Zach was going to go over our um, PPE. Um, I know it's at this point, everybody knows a little bit about PPE, but I, I just think everyone should just listen for a few minutes while Zach goes over it, just in case. Sure thing. Well, I, I just want to touch base um, with everybody. Obviously, if you are a medical provider, you're going to be doing best practices. You're going to be doing what you're normally used to. So this conversation is primarily for our non-medical volunteers, just kind of going over once again, um, face masks and gloves and things like that. We're following uh, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health guidelines as far as face masks go. So covering all the time when we're around, when we're in close proximity of one another. Uh, thankfully, this site has, you know, will either be outside or in the large bays or things like that. So we won't be congregating in large groups um, close together or anything like that. Uh, I've just got a regular uh, procedure mask here, surgical procedure mask. Um, if you're gonna be using one of these, typically the white side goes on the inside. Um, and the best practice for these is always to grab them by the elastic bands whenever you're putting them on or taking them off. The phrase that we use is donning and doffing. Donning is putting something on, doffing is taking it off. I don't know why we say that, it's just what we say. So if you hear me say that, um, that's what I mean. Uh, before we touch our face or anything like that, we always want to do uh, hand hygiene. So we'll have uh, disinfectant um, or soap and water is always best. So Best practice, if we're gonna put this on, hand hygiene, we pick it up by the ear loops and we place it on. I think you can still probably hear me. Um, and then assuming this is a new one and I just washed my hands as well, uh, there's a little metal tab in here. I just lightly press it on both sides and it forms to my face. And I wanna make sure it's over my nose and under my chin. When it comes time to take it off, I don't wanna to touch the front of the mask, um, just like I don't wanna to touch my face or anything like that. So we just grab it by the loops and we take it off like that. If you're gonna put it down and then reuse it, uh, we can either put it in a paper bag or we can put it on like a paper towel or something like that. We put the contaminated side out. So when we pick it up, it's, it's ready to go. Um, we don't have to uh, handle things like that. Uh, don't touch your face, wash your hands. If you accidentally touch your face, wash your hands. Before you touch your face, wash your hands, but don't touch your face. Um, and for people with small faces who this is gonna to be too big for. There's a little trick. Um, if you take the loop here, we'll actually fold it in half. So this loop string is together and we'll tie it in a knot and we'll do it on both sides. And you're gonna get this little, uh, this little pinch here. My face is a little bit too big for this, but you'll see what I'm, what I'm doing here. Um, you wanna make sure you, you can put this on and Same rules apply. You've got this little opening here. So we tuck that in. And for people with smaller faces, this is kind of the uh, life hack for you to uh, make a better seal. So if anybody struggles with that, you can try that on the day. Um, so that's face masks. And the last thing is gloves. So for our non-medical providers, uh, if you're gonna be 
hand, handing anything, uh, registration forms, things like that. Uh, we'll give you we'll give you gloves that you can wear. Um, putting gloves on, donning gloves is pretty simple stuff. Um, I think we can all put on a pair of gloves. We can, um, and we recommend that you can just leave these on and then you can wash and sanitize the gloves. So if you have a line of cars coming through and you're handing things over, um, you can just leave your gloves on and sanitize your gloves as long as we don't touch our face or anything like that. And then if it's time to take a break, go to the bathroom or something like that, the correct way to remove gloves is um, we, if we're assuming the outside of the glove is the dangerous part, the contaminated part, I can grab and pinch the outside and turn that inside out. So now the contaminated part is on the inside and I can crumple it up. And underneath here now, I take a finger underneath the glove and pull that around. And now everything's contained on the inside. That's how we typically dispose of gloves. So that's the safest way to do it. And I don't actually touch the outside, but whenever we take PPE off, best thing to do is always to wash our hands, hygiene, and then go about our business. So I think anything else? No, I just want people to know that we do have plenty of PPE. So, um, you know, take off your gloves if you have to, or take off your mask, we can give you a new one again. Um, also, we're just um, trying to make sure everyone has masks um, that day. So um, come and we'll um, distribute them for you. Can I just add one thing, Carolyn? Sure, sure. Hi everyone, Tolly Stark. Um, I just wanted to add that, you know, with the COVID protocol to be sure when you are inside the highway garage, whether that's to use the bathroom or whatnot, that you continue to wear your mask during that time. And also at any time, if anyone needs like a mask break or needs to step away for any reason, definitely speak up and let us know because we want everyone to be comfortable and, you know, be able to do what they need to do. So um, yeah, just try. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so if anybody has any questions, um, we'll try to answer them um, and, and get back to you. And um, But thank you so much for spending time tonight to zoom in. <laughs> and I'm sorry there's no pizza, but it was nice to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Carolyn. Thank, thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Carolyn. Bye. Carolyn, I'm coming uh, over for thanks, pizza. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks. I want cinnamon buns. <laughs> oh, that was a yeah. choice? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah Carolyn, we got to get some of those sticky buns for sure. Yeah, those sticky buns. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. Trevor, everybody for showing up. Thanks, Carolyn. Bye-bye. Good night, guys.